Good morning. Uh, so I will uh, be filling in today for both Pastor Craig and Eric. Those bums, those fine gentlemen uh, are both out this morning. Uh, excuse me, that just slipped right out. Uh, Craig is still uh, in Spain, and Craig, I'm sorry, and Eric unfortunately came down with the flu pretty severely over the week and was gracious enough to spread that to his family. So uh, we'll be praying for them this morning. Uh, Craig will be returning to us pretty soon, so we'll be praying for uh, him and his wife as they travel. And uh, certainly someone in the congregation over the past few weeks has prayed for patience because you get two weeks of a Yankee up here, so your prayers have been answered. Amen. Amen. Uh, we'll start off with uh, last week's memory verse. First, I just welcome you to Barry's Grove. And if you don't know me, my name is Jonathan, and I'm the youth minister. Uh, I'm just glad to have everyone join us this morning. We'll start off with last week's memory verse. Uh, and if you get the hand motions, you get extra credit. Uh, so it was in Romans 12, too, uh, and I don't know if we said it last Sunday, but the, the version that we did memorize at camp was an NIV, and so you maybe have memorized it in a different translation, and if, if that's the case, of course, that's fine. Uh, but if you've remembered last week's verse, uh, and you can say that with me now, if you want to do the hand motions, you are welcome to. Uh, but it said, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. I don't know if they explained this last week, but that was a that was a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. So that might have looked weird that we were doing that last week, but that was a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. So be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may test and approve what is God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And this was running. I'm not really sure... Uh, exactly how that fits to will. I guess it's because it takes a lot of willpower to run. I wouldn't know, but apparently it does. <laughs> uh, so that was Romans 12 too, and thank you if you got that. Uh, we are going to watch a video now for our prayer focus, and it would seem like uh, this fits well on a week where most of our staff is out, but this was actually planned. Uh, June the 29th is uh, a day that's set aside by the organization Voice of the Martyrs as the Day of the Christian Martyr. Just a day to, to set aside to remember those who have served and served to the point of, of giving their lives. Uh, and certainly we could also include those who have been willing to give their lives, but specifically those who have served in missions and many in foreign missions that ended in giving their lives. So we're going to look um, at an individual today that probably uh, most of us would remember. Uh, this is recent. And so we're going to watch a video uh, and then I'll come back up and uh, conclude our time for our, our prayer focus and pray for us. God, I don't want to die. Who will take my place if I do? Jesus told his followers to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, to every nation, to the ends of the earth. John Chow was a teenager when he took his first missions trip and when he felt called to invest his life to reach the people of North Sentinel Island, who had violently rejected all previous contact with outsiders. John answered that call. Here am I, send me. For the next nine years, every decision John made was with an eye toward going ashore on North Sentinel Island. He served in multiple countries to gain missions and ministry experience. He trained in linguistics to help learn their language. He was certified as an EMT in the hope of serving the tribesmen medically. Once I said yes to Jesus, I was committed. I was all in. I believe that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience. I want my life to reflect obedience to Christ and to live in obedience to him. I think that Jesus is worth it. He's worth everything. In 2018, with the backing of his missions agency, John went to North Sentinel Island. He knew the risks, but his passion for the North Sentinelese 
and his desire to be obedient to Christ drove him forward. Sitting in the boat, getting ready to go ashore, John penned a final note and a challenge to his family. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to, and I'll see you again when you pass through the veil. The eternal lives of this tribe is at hand, and I can't wait to see them around the throne of God, worshiping in their own language as Revelation 7, 9 to 10 states. I pray none of you love anything in this world more than Jesus Christ. Within hours of writing those words, John Chow was killed by the Islanders. John believed that the measure of success in the kingdom of God is obedience, and he would be obedient to God's call, no matter the cost. Who will pay the price to go to every tribe? And so I don't know if you remember uh, hearing of him in the news. I certainly do. Uh, and I certainly knew many people who were pretty quick to judge uh, maybe the foolishness uh, of his actions. And, and that's, that's not really what I'm here to, to point out. I don't think that's what the video is here to highlight. Um, but just quickly to think about his statement that the measure of success is obedience to Christ. Uh, certainly as I, as I watched this video earlier in the week and as I thought about him, uh, the name Jim Elliot came to, not, to mind, uh, a missionary very similar who, who went to an aggressive people group who at the time had been unreached, who knew the risk, and who, of course, gave his life. Uh, and, and many would look at that and say, you know, what a waste. Uh, what a waste. But, of course, uh, we would not look at it that way. We would look at it as, as Mr. Cho here said, that it was obedient. He felt called to go. He went. Uh, and I think he had a great mindset. I'll, I'll reference him a little bit more uh, later during the sermon. Um, oh, is that her? I didn't turn it on. Look at that. Turn it on, it works better. I'm like an old person. Uh, so I'm just going to go through some slides that the Voice of the Martyrs have sent to us. Uh, so if you are not familiar with North Sentinel Island, and, and I would be surprised if you were, it's usually referenced as being near India, and it's really much more near Indonesia, but it's just a, a teeny tiny island uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean. And all, just so you know, all the video and, and all the, the images in the video we just saw were not of the Sentinelese people. They were certainly of other people. They're, this picture here is really the only picture we have, or one of the only pictures we have of the natives to that island. Um, they have no scripture. They have no message uh, from the gospel. Uh, and this was the burden that, that John Chow felt. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how we got connected to this one particular island of all the people groups in the world, but he felt the burden to go. He felt the call of Romans 10, uh, which clearly says if, if people do not hear the gospel, uh, they, they won't be saved. Uh, they won't piece it together themselves. They won't figure it out, and their lives and their eternity is worth it. And so he went. And so I would encourage you to, to look more up about him if you are unfamiliar with him or, or perhaps you just remember a, a little blip in the media about him uh, back in 2018. Certainly we would want to pray uh, for the people of this island and, and the islands around them. Uh, they are not unique necessarily. Uh, so there's a, a picture of a map of, of where the island would be, be located. Uh, but there are many, many people groups in our world that do not know Christ. Uh, roughly a billion people have had no direct contact. These people have a very, obviously, they're, they're isolated on an island, uh, but there are many, many people groups. Roughly 13% of the planet would sit in the same circumstance as the Sentinelese people. No contact at all directly with the gospel or anyone related to Christ. Uh, and uh, here's a, an excellent prayer, and this is the prayer that I'll pray in just a second, that we would pray that these people groups, and specifically the Sentinelese, 
uh, would sing a new song. That Revelation 5 says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And, and these people are certainly included in that list. Uh, and so this may be a prayer that you could pray yourself this morning and throughout the week. Lord, I'm not perfect. I'm willing to share Christ in my community, city, nation, world, and I commit today to follow your direction. And I'd say whatever criticism you maybe remember or hear of, uh, of people like Mr. Chow, uh, certainly his obedience to Christ I think is commendable. And it led him somewhere and it cost him something and he was willing to pay that for the Lord. Uh, there's that statistic I shared, uh, a billion people living without knowledge of the gospel, those people included. Uh, so we'll just, we'll take a time to pray uh, and on this, and the day of, if I didn't say it, the, the day of the martyr is, uh, Christian martyrs, June the 29th, so we're celebrating it today because it's the Sunday before that. Uh, so I would just encourage you to, to have this subject on your hearts and your minds. Pray for those that are serving around the world, and certainly pray that, that the Lord would send out more who are willing to bring the gospel at whatever cost. Let's pray. Father, as we just sang, you are good. You are so good. You have never let us down. Lord, we can hear stories like this account from the video of, uh, of people who have given their lives, and, and many would view that as reckless. Many people would view that as a waste. But Lord, we can look at that and say that you, you did not let us down. The church did not lose someone uh, for no reason that Mr. Chow did not give up his life recklessly, but in obedience, Lord, he served you. He felt your call. He knew that your spirit could guide him. He knew that all things worked for good, including uh, being killed, for those that are loved and, and called according to your good purpose. So, God, we do lift up those who serve around the world, Lord, those that serve here in our community, those that serve in, in foreign places, Lord, people who will never get the recognition uh, of a Sunday morning video, but yet serve week in and week out, putting their life on the line, and for the many uh, over the centuries who have given their lives, who have shed their blood for the gospel. Lord, the scriptures are clear uh, that they will be honored, that their lives will be an example for the church to follow for all the years to come until you return. So God, we pray blessings upon them. We pray that you'd give them courage. For the missionaries that serve you, we pray that you'd give them boldness. We pray that you'd comfort their fears. But God, we do pray that the gospel would go powerfully into this world. Lord, this world is a dark place. We know that. Your heart is for the lost. Your heart is for those who are apart from you. So, God, we pray that you would send us out boldly. And we're thankful for those who take the gospel into dangerous places, into unreached places. We pray that that gospel, as you promised, would bear fruit. And we pray that we would do the same even in our own homes and our workplaces, that your name would be lifted up and made much of, that Christ would be renowned throughout the world, and the gospel would have an impact in the lives of those who are now perishing. God, we commend all this to you, knowing that this is your promise, and we pray this in your name. Amen.
I'm going to come back to the memory verse in a little bit, but we are going to look at Galatians uh, 1 and 2 uh, this morning, and I did forget to grab my Bible out of the car. So we're going to look at Galatians 1 and 2. I'll say one of the things I love about Barry's Grove, and there's a lot of things that I love quite a bit, but one of the things I really love is the church's commitment to expositional preaching. And what I mean by that, of course, is just the working through the scriptures, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, when Craig's here, punctuation mark by, I'm kidding, no. Uh, but just, just methodically and carefully looking through the scriptures. I, I love that. I think that's the, one of the chief marks of a healthy church. It's a challenge a little bit to step in kind of intermittently uh, to, to do that. Because uh, I can't just pick up on a, a, a word or a verse. Um, so what I've tended to do over the years when I, I get a chance to preach is, is to, to grab a, maybe a slightly bigger passage and, and work at it not the same that Craig does where he goes verse by verse uh, with the youth. When, when we go through books with the youth, and, and I do something quite similar uh, there where we just go through a, a book chapter by chapter, line by line. We, we move at that kind of glacial pace. Through a, through a text, uh, but when I get like a, a one time or a couple of times chance to preach, I usually grab a slightly bigger passage, and I don't necessarily hit every word and, and, and every, every piece of it, uh, just to give you some insight to, to how I pick these out, but I am going to look at two chapters of Galatians, and that would be terrifying if maybe other preachers were here, but we'll try to get out before four uh, so I can make it to youth, promise, uh, and I'm going to come back to the memory verse, uh, that'll be in coming up. But we're going to look at the power of a, a testimony. So when I was in high school, uh, I, I went to a summer camp, much like, much like our youth do. We'd, we'd go for a week. And I, I bet you can imagine, even if you've never been, I, I bet you can imagine uh, what you know, might would or would not work at a, a teen summer camp. Uh, and might, what you might not picture is uh, a woman in her late 70s, um, maybe even 80s, I'm not, I'm not actually sure how, how old she was, uh, but this woman came to camp one year and gave her testimony, and it has stuck with me vividly ever since. I won't, I won't give it to you the, the way that she did, but just in short, uh, she said, you know, picture a small town, just picture a small agrarian town where she grew up, uh, and picture things not being well. So she grew up in uh, what we would call the Great Depression years. Uh, and she said, there was, there was three things my, my town didn't have, work, food, and hope. We were out of all of them. And she said, then one day, uh, a parade came to town, a parade primarily of politicians, a political parade, and then they came promising work, food, and hope. And they delivered. And she goes on to share her testimony. The details I'm leaving out is maybe you're picturing something like Roxboro or a town in Indiana. This is a town in Czechoslovakia, and the political parade coming through town was the Nazis. She says she remembers clearly as a young girl watching the tanks and the soldiers and the banners march over the mountains and through her village. And she was, you know, of course, awestruck by all the splendor of it, and she said, this man promised my village food, work, and hope that this time of rags would turn to riches, that we would not be this poor slum, that these countries would rise again to greatness. And she said, you know what? He delivered. And she said, and this is a, an elderly woman sitting on a stool in front of a room packed with 14-year-olds who are captivated by her testimony that she loved Adolf Hitler. And she joined his ranks as a teen youth leader served him for years, uh, and in her testimony, she shares about uh, what, sh what she did, uh, how she came to uh, realize the, the truth of what she had been told for years, that this was all terrible. And she said, you know, this is all evil propaganda, uh, this is, is all terrible. She, she ends up at the end of the war being captured in a Russian communist prison, which is probably everything it's cracked up to be, uh, eventually escapes and is caught by the Americans, who she had been told will find you, rape you, kill you, and then probably rape you again, because they are evil. The Americans are as evil as it gets. And I share all that this morning because she believed the words of someone's testimony. 
She believed this man would provide for her what her village, what the men in her village, her father, her grandparents did not have. And he did. They had food. They prospered. They had work. The things she said after that were not the same. And she devoted herself fully to the Nazi cause. And when she heard things like, well, we're rounding people up like cattle and, and butchering them, she said, that's, that's lies. That's, that's nonsense. We would never do that. I'm, I'm part of this. We would never do that. She believed the testimony of, of us, of the Americans, right? Now she, uh, or in her, in her later years, she would say, uh, freedom is the greatest gift that God has ever given to humanity, and I think America has done it well. And she, she moved to the United States, and she loved democracy and freedom, but at a time, to her, the testimony of what that represented was enough to make her fear it, uh, just to be uh, just totally paralyzed by the idea of being captured by the Americans. She would have rather had gone back to the Russian prison by her own testimony, uh, rather than being caught by the Americans. So the power of someone's story, the power of a testimony is tremendous. So I'm going to read uh, through the first chapter here. Uh, I would encourage you to read along with me. So again, I'm in the book of Galatians. Uh, if you are using one of the, if you don't have your own Bible, there's some black Bibles in the pews in front of you. I'm on page 1031. It's fairly close to the end. And it says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not from men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace and peace, uh, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a, go a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him. As we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, a curse be on him. For am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it. But it came by a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond, my, beyond many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. I did not go up to Jerusalem or to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. I declare in the sight of God, I am not lying in what I write to you. Afterwards, I went to the regions of Syria and Sicilia, and I remained personally unknown to the Judean churches that are in Christ. They simply kept hearing, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Let's pray as we uh, get into the message. Father God, thank you for this good word. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of Scripture. Thank you that it is sure and true, that it is rock solid, that we can lean on it, rest on it, come to it knowing that it is always appropriate. It is always useful for us to teach us and to train us, that every word of it has been breathed out of your mouth for our good and for your glory. And we pray that those two things would happen this morning. Amen. Uh, so just a little uh, kind of geographic background. You might have a map or something like this in your Bibles, but this would be taking place in the area that, that we would call Turkey. Uh, some kind of central Turkey would be what Galatia had been at the time. Uh, if you were on like Google Earth or, or a map, you'd go to the Mediterranean Sea, find the island of Cyprus, which is that island on the bottom right, and pretty much go straight north. There's a lot of interesting things to study in the book of Galatians. I'm not going to hit most of them. Um, so for example, 
is Paul writing to the northern, the ethnic Galatians, people that were descended from the Celtic people? Is he writing to the more national or political Galatians in the south? That kind of fits in with the book of Acts in chapters 13 and 14. And there's several cities listed there that, that Paul likely visited and did some church planning in. But either way, he's, he's working in this part uh, of the world on his many missionary journeys. And he writes to them about this idea of gospel options. He writes to them about this idea of this one contrary gospel. He says, those are, those, those, some have come to you and, and produced this, this contrary false gospel, but then he kind of references these other gospels. He says they're really not, not real, but there is this idea that there's other gospel options. Uh, and, I, and if I asked us, you know, how many gospels are there, and, and I, we don't mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we would say there's one. Right? We, we all know the good Sunday school answer. I'm going to use that term a lot, the Sunday school or Sunday school answer. What I mean by that is that many of us, if not all of us, know the answers to a lot of biblical trivia. We, we know the right answers to say in church. And that's, that's great. I'm not knocking that. I'm not demeaning that. But what I'm going to challenge us with, I'm going to challenge myself with, is even though I know that on Sunday, do I know that on Tuesday? Does it, does it play out in my life? I might know the answer, that there's one gospel, but practically, do I live that out amid all the other options that are presented to me? Of course, we know the, the word gospel means good news. If you don't know that, you're welcome. The word gospel means good news. But what is that? Is good news something like the economy rebounding? Uh, things coming back? I mean, that'd be good news, right? We'd be happy with that. Do I take good news to mean my bank account balance or perhaps my 401k? Does some financial statement give me good news? Or is really the absence of bad news enough good news for me? The, the old saying that no news is good news, as long as I don't know something bad's happened or as long as nothing bad actually comes to pass, maybe that's good enough news for me. And when we think about really good news, we think about what can save me. And again, in, in Sunday school, that word save would have a particular meaning. But maybe on the other days of the week, it, it has others. Is living to old age, is, is that my salvation? Is, is the story of John Chow a nightmare? I'd love to serve Christ, but if it involves dying at that age, mm-mm. I need to live to old age, and I need to work on bigger font. This is ridiculous. Uh, is being healthy. So maybe I don't need a quantity of life, but I need a quality of life. And so how I look and how I appear and what my, what my body looks like and how it functions, is that my salvation? Is that what I'm seeking to save me? And again, I wouldn't say that in Sunday school, but is that how I live the other six days? Is the amount of recognition I get Maybe at work, uh, do I get promoted? Do my coworkers see me and, and give me accolades? Do I get compliments for what I do? Or uh, in our day, uh, how much social media recognition do I get? How many followers do I have? What kind of image have I portrayed and have people bought that? Because if they, don't, if they know the real picture of me, uh, I'm not saved. But if they believe this image I'm putting forward, and if people think I'm, I'm all that, uh, then that, that would save me. And maybe it's just how many things I have. Or maybe I have a great quality or a great quantity of, of things. And so I know the answer is yes, Jesus saves and, and only in him. But the reality is Jesus has already saved me. And if I could get that one more thing, that'd be better. But John says in 1 John 2.16, and he's got some, some brashness here to him, everything in the world is not from the Father. John says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, my, my bodily carnal desires, the lust of the eyes, the things that I see and want, and the pride in what I have, the pride in one's possessions, is not from the Father, but from the world. Meaning, there's nothing here that can save me. It might be enjoyable for a time, it might be tasteful, it might be something I want, but it has no salvific effect. But the fact is, we are confronted with multiple vine gospels every single day of the week. So if you're like me, I don't know if you can see him, but there's a, a man like myself, some lost chump looking at the spaghetti aisle. Uh, and so I go to the store, and I, I, I have a list, right? 
And it's not a very detailed list. It's deodorant, spaghetti sauce, soap, whatever. And I want to walk in, and I want there to be a bottle of soap, uh, you know, a jar of, jar of spaghetti sauce and one thing of soap, and I'm going to pick them up. And there's so many options, I just stand there for maybe an hour or two just staring. And I don't know what any of them are. One of the deodorants has a bear on it. I don't know if you've ever smelled a bear, but I don't know why that's on a deodorant. The next one has a sea monster on it, which consequently is the one I use, if you're curious. The next one has a wolf, which seems to be the best smelling of bear, seafood, and dog, I guess. And so I just stare at them thinking, do I want to smell like these things? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then there's only 15,000 spaghetti sauces, and of course, you know, the one I grab, no one likes, so that's fine. But isn't it the same thing with when I look at the world and think about what is good news for me? And this is what Paul is getting at with the Galatians, that here today, we know what the gospel is. We could reiterate it. We, we say, yes, I believe in that. But the fact is, I spend most of my time, maybe subconsciously, thinking and looking for some kind of good news to save me. And if I'm, if I'm honest, it might not always be the answer I gave on Sunday. So I just want to give some clarity here. When Paul is talking about false gospels, when he says, all right, Galatians, all right, Barry's Grove, you got to pay attention. There are those coming, there are those among you, there will be things you hear, there will be things you read, and, and they're not. There's only one gospel. What is he talking about? Is he talking about other religions? I don't think so. Now, other religions can offer a, a false promise, absolutely, but I don't think he's thinking about Islam or the worship of Baal or, or another fake religion. And I say that because he says, people have come among you and they're distorting or, or twisting or perverting the gospel of Christ. They're not, they're not dismissing Christ. They're not saying nonsense. Look at our religion. They're saying, well, yeah, 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 you're on the right track, but the, you got to twist it a little bit. you got to make it a little bit different. Is he talking about something that saves? Is he talking about losing our salvation? This is a big question. Because he's talking to a church. He's talking to saved, believing, good Christian Baptist people here in Galatia. So is he talking about someone coming in, giving them a message which they might grab onto, and by grabbing onto that message, lose the real gospel? And I'm going to say again, no. Uh, one, that, that's not a doctrine that, that we subscribe to. That once we are saved, we are in God's hand. Nothing, including ourselves, can take us out of his hand. And I don't think that's the point Paul's getting at. I don't think he's saying, be careful because, you know, you get taken out of the game here. So what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the real gospel and anything contrary to it's a false gospel. So I'm sure, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a specific circumstance that Paul is thinking about. Maybe he even knows individuals. He knows someone has come into these churches that he's planted, he's worked with, he's spent time with. People there he knows personally by name. He knows, I'm sure, some circumstance where someone's coming. We just don't have the details of that what this false gospel is. But he knows the purpose of the true gospel. And he says, there's really no other gospel. I'm saying false gospels. I'm saying gospels contrary. But there really is no other gospel. And Paul knows, and, and we know, the purpose of the gospel is the work of Christ. That's the gospel. What, what Christ is doing is, is good news. And the gospel is the work of Christ in ransoming the lost. I'm not going to read or have every one of these verses uh, on the screen. If you want to just write them down, maybe in your notes. Uh, but in Matthew and in Mark, Jesus said that he's come to be the ransom for many, to give his life as a ransom for many, to buy back those who are lost, to purchase those who are trapped in sin. Uh, he's come to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1.15 says that the gospel is the good work of Christ to save sinners. And, and those are all true. Those are absolutely true. But I'm hoping this morning that that's not where we would stop. As I look around our world, I've seen too many Christians struggling with despair, living joylessly, living defeated. Maybe that would even describe some in our congregation. And I think the reason of that is we miss this idea that the gospel is not just getting us to heaven. It's not just a get out of hell card. It certainly is that, and I'm grateful for that. But John 10, 10, Jesus says, I've come to what? Give life and give it abundantly, right? The Bible is not wishy-washy about the doctrine of hell. That's something that our culture has uh, slid downhill on. But the fact is Jesus spends much, 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 much more time 
talking about the life that's available in Christ rather than just some fire insurance. He, he's not unclear about it. He doesn't mince words about it. He's very clear. There's a place for those who have rejected Christ, and it will not be pleasant. But he spends a great deal more time, and, and the gospel writer, or the, the other New Testament writers also spend a great deal amount of more time with this subject. Christ says, I've come to not, not just make sure you don't go to hell someday and you can live your mediocre life in the meantime. He says, no, 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 I've come that you would have life now, abundant life, not a little bit of life, not an okay life, not a get better life, not a if you find the right self-help book, life, true life, and that is the work of Christ in the gospel. And of course, the gospel is for taking our sin, First Corinthians 5, 21 says that in Christ's death and burial, our sin was nailed to the cross, that he became our sin. He didn't just uh, submit a payment. He became sin. He took our sin upon him. It was dead. It was nailed. It was buried. And here's good news. Jesus was resurrected, but my sin was not. It was nailed to the cross. He was nailed to the cross. They went into the grave, but only he came back. My sin stays dead. And in him rising, he gives me righteousness. He took on my sin. He became sin so that I could become the righteousness of God. And this is the purpose of the gospel. What's the pursuance or the plan of the gospel? I put that the gospel is the plan of God for the church. What do you mean by that, Jonathan? Hey, thanks for asking. What I mean is, again, the gospel is not just a one-time, let's get out of hell. Let's just get saved and then just go do whatever you want. The gospel is the plan of God, contrived by God, thought of by God, purposed by God, for the church. And I say that because the church is God's plan for the nations. To reach the nations and to display his glory, glory God made the church. If we paid attention to the first part of Galatians 1, Paul says that he was not taught the gospel. He did not have a, a seminary class or a Sunday school teacher that laid out the gospel for him. He says, I wasn't taught it. But he didn't get it from the apostles either. He didn't go to those who he knew, knew Jesus, and got it from them. He says, Jesus gave it to me directly. And we know that. We read Acts, and, and he had this encounter with the Lord where, where he came to Christ. I think Paul was probably the exception here. I'm not saying this has never happened again, I don't know, but my guess is uh, even if the Lord has appeared to someone like Paul and pronounced the gospel to them, my guess is this is the exception, that most people do not hear the gospel directly from the Lord in a vision. Most people hear the gospel from us or they don't. Yes. That's why we watch that video. That's why we celebrate those who are willing to go out and count the cost and give the gospel. I mean, God could do that. Absolutely he could, Right? God could just reveal himself to everyone personally like he did Paul. Well, why not? I'm not sure the full answer to that, but I do know that the church, not direct revelation from Jesus, is God's plan to get the gospel into the hearts and minds of people. So that people who are lost and estranged from Christ would be brought back, that people who are trapped in the kingdom of darkness would come to the kingdom of light, and that his glory would be made known. Amen. That is purposed through us. And if you hear that this morning and you think, oh, brother, we're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, and God knows that, right? He's not a fool. And in fact, he says, by your weaknesses, I'll be made stronger. I'll, I'll be shown to be stronger, right? God accomplishing something through us, certainly through me, gives him glory, not me. It, it makes him look good working through us. And so taking the good news to the, to the nations is God's plan meaning it's our plan. And the fact is the gospel is freedom. The plan of the gospel is freedom. Yes. Not just freedom from hell. Again, it is. I'm not demeaning that or, or minimizing that in any way. But Jesus said, I've come so people would have true life and true freedom. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through chapter 2 here, a little bit of it. Uh, before I do, uh, if you want to go ahead and read the memory verse this week, no hand motions. If you want to come up with some and show us next week, extra credit to you. Uh, but this week, just the verse. So it'll be Galatians 2.20. So read along with me. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who loved me and gave himself for me. That's good news. That's good news. Starting in uh, chapter 2. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. I went up according to a revelation and presented to them the gospel I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those recognized as leaders. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ in order to enslave us. But we did not give up and submit to these people for even a moment, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved for you. Now from those recognized as important, what they once were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to me. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised. That would mean Gentiles, not Jewish people, just as Peter was for the circumcised or the Jewish people. Since the one at work in Peter for an apostleship to the circumcised was also at work in me for the Gentiles. When James, Cephas, and John, those recognized as pillars, acknowledged the grace that had been given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and, that, and they to the circumcised. They asked only that we would remember the poor, which I had made every effort to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you, who are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? We are not Jews by birth. We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus. This was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no human will be justified. But if we ourselves are also found to be sinners while seeking to be justified by Christ, is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Uh, so I, I'm going to go over this little chart for a second, and before I do that, I would commend to you, uh, if you do your, your personal time with resources, other books, and, and study aids, I think that's awesome. If you don't, um, I would commend you to sometimes do that. Not all the time, right? Spend more time in this than other things. Uh, but I took what's on the screen now in part from this little commentary. It's a series called Christ-Centered Christ Exposition. Um, it's a series of commentaries uh, put on by Dr. Aiken, who's the president of Southeastern Seminary. And uh, these are great. They're very devotional, very personal, very inexpensive. They're like four, I'm sorry, uh, eight to $14, something like that. Uh, and they're really good. So I would commend these to you if you don't use something on a regular basis for uh, your study or devotional time. That can be super helpful. Uh, but I took what's on the board here from, from this. So what this is getting at is this idea of freedom, this idea of what the gospel allows for us, uh, opens us up to do, in part is to live to please God. So if the gospel is not just about not going to hell, if we don't just go to heaven once we get saved, What's the deal? What's the point? Well, part of the point is we would live on this world in a way that pleases the Lord. There's lots of ways that happens, but we live to please the Lord. But what I mean by this, and, and what, what I got out of here, is this means in reality. This doesn't mean in perception. So it's not the way I, I view it. You know the phrase, uh, this, the thought that counts? Trust me, being married for a few, a few years I didn't get you a present, but I thought about it. Nope. Mm-mm. Doesn't work. So we're talking about really, really pleasing the Lord. Not just intending to, not just trying to, but what actually, what kind of life really pleases the Lord? Well, in the first category here, we have wrong belief and wrong action. 
So you do not believe the claims of the Bible. You do not believe the claims of Scripture. You do not believe the doctrines or the tenets of Christianity. You don't believe in Christ. You don't believe in any of that. And you live accordingly. So we would say sinners living in sin. Well, surprise, those people, eh, strike one, are not living to please God. God doesn't look down and say, cool. No, obviously. But now we could look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. These are not those people, right? These people are coming in with a very Christian guise to them, right? They're kind of a wolf in Christian clothing, if you will. They have wrong beliefs. They are not in accordance with Scripture. Paul is clear. Their gospel isn't just a variation on the gospel. It is, it is a false gospel. This is wrong. This is not the truth. But they have right action. Now, Galatians doesn't talk about the Pharisees, but I, I put that in there because I think we're probably more familiar with the idea of the Pharisees than this, this group of people in Galatians. So here's a people that, that look correct, right? They know what to do. They've memorized the memory verse. They give their tithe. They know what not to do, what to do. They, they come to church dressed appropriately. They, they do all the right things, but they got none of it. So we'll have to give them a strike too. But now we get into some trouble. In Galatians 2, 11 through 14, we see a situation where many of our own people, many of people from our tradition, our good Christian, Protestant, Baptist, evangelical people, we could be in great danger here. Because we've been raised, I, I've been raised in a tradition where we're overtaught that just belief matters. So is theology important? Absolutely. I have several shelves on my bookshelf at home that are, are just ridiculously large and dry theology books. And, and I love them. Theology is super important. But we can be tempted to think it's all important and nothing else matters. So here we have some people like Peter who have right belief. And, and Peter gets a lot of flack, but let's be honest. If I was in one of the 12, I wouldn't have been Peter. I would not have been the guy to jump out of the boat. I would not have been the first one to stand up and say, you are the Christ. I'm probably a little bit more like some of the other ones. But Peter has right doctrine. He knows what's going on. But he doesn't live it out. So what's going on here is there are some Jewish people who come to town, and, and normally he's hanging out with his friends, people who were, who were lost, people who were uh, you know, not good church people, and they've been saved. And, and so they're in fellowship, and they're sharing meals together, and they're hanging out together. And all of a sudden, you know, some good church people show up, and, and Peter kind of distances themselves from them. And Paul says, what are you doing, man? That's not the gospel. The gospel is we are all sinners equally. It doesn't matter your ethnicity or your heritage or your parents or your bank account. We're all in the same place pot here, and, and Christ has redeemed us by his grace, not by our merits, and you can't separate from them because you want to impress these people. That's not the gospel, Pete. And so he has right beliefs. He knows what's going on, but he doesn't live it out. So in verses 15 through 21, Paul lays out, this is what you would have to believe and do. We need both. You can't just act right, and I think most of us know that. You've got to have it in here, but we can't just have it in here. Another commentator about this passage said, this means that saving faith cannot be reduced to a one-time decision. We had two youth last year at camp give their lives to Christ from, from our church. They, they turned one year old this year at camp, which is outstanding. Some of us, it's maybe been longer than that. For me, it's been about 26 years. My faith better have something to say since that time period. There, there needs to be something else in my life rather than that one decision some years ago. So he says it cannot be reduced to a one-time decision or event in the past. It is a living, dynamic reality permeating every aspect of a believer's life. And I think an even better quote uh, comes from Calvin, and it says, it is faith alone that justifies, but the faith that justifies is not alone. If you truly have right doctrine, it will live itself out in your life. And when we see that in Peter's life, yeah, he makes an error here, but he comes around, right? He repents. Uh, he, he comes back to living the gospel outrightly. If anyone's curious, did I name my son after K 
Calvin the theologian or Calvin the kid? The answer is yes. Yes, I did. <laughs> and for those of you who are kind of nerdy, and you're going to say, well, you know that Calvin was named after Calvin too. I know that. I know that. But I still named them after both. Now, was it God's providence that he turned out to look and act like Calvin? I think so. I think so. Uh, my favorite Calvin, and I'll just go off the rails for a second. My favorite Calvin and Hobbes cartoon of all time. If you've never read Calvin and Hobbes, absolute shame on you. Good gosh. Uh, so go home and read some. But my absolute favorite sketch is just a couple blank panels. There's no words at all till the end. Calvin's in the living room, and he's got about 50 nails, and he's working on the next one in the, in the coffee table. And his mom walks in with lunch, and she looks down and, you know, just throws everything and screams, what are you doing? And the next panel is just him looking down. The next panel is just him looking up, and he goes, is that a trick question? <laughs> All right, so the gospel is freedom. That was just, that had nothing to do with anything. That was a total squirrel rabbit trail. Sorry. So freedom. So th this quote from Calvin, uh, that the faith that justifies is not alone, the, the things I looked at before. That, that correlates in this idea that the gospel is freeing, meaning it gives us the ability to do as we would, to move without constraint. What do I mean by that? What I mean is what Jesus said. I don't know if you've ever tied this passage, the, the vine and the branches, in with the idea of freedom. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Now let's do a quick grammar lesson, what it doesn't say. If you remain in me and I in you, you might bear much fruit. No. If you remain in me and I in you, you could bear... No. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear... You know, you could, yeah, maybe you'll bear some fruit, probably. Mm -mm. You will bear much fruit. If you are in Christ, not you should, not you better, not if you don't or else, you will have a fruitful life. And the good news is that apart from him, we can't do anything, but we are in him, and therefore we will. And that is freedom. That, that's not a burden. That's not, oh, gosh, i got to bear fruit now. That's, uh, no, no, that is, that is freeing because this is what we want, right? We want our lives to have substance and purpose and meaning. I want to accomplish something. I want to leave a legacy. But not the legacy I, I don't want to leave is, is my namesake. I don't need the to name tonight lifted up on a banner for all to mispronounce and remember forever. I need the name of Christ lifted up. And my legacy can be that because of this freedom in the gospel, that I can bear good fruit, the fruit of loving my neighbor as myself, the, the fruit of encouraging people and being grateful for all that God has given me, the fruit of being patient with those who need patience because God was patient and kind to me and that led to my repentance and I can mirror that to others and, and help bring them to saving faith. And the, of course, the freedom and the fruit of, of bringing the gospel to the lost, whether that's at a distant island with, with violent people or with my neighbor or my coworker or my family member who I've shared with a, a thousand times. And if I'm honest, I might be a little bit more scared about sharing with them than the person who might actually spear me through the chest. But the gospel frees me. So what do we do with it? What do we do with it? I'm just going to skip that. Uh, so here's a long passage. I'm not going to read through this one, but if you want to read it through 1 Corinthians 9, um, later this afternoon, I would commend that. But here Paul talks about this idea that the gospel is freedom, freed him. And what does he do with that? Well, he says, I will become all things to all people so that in any possible way, someone might get saved. So what Paul doesn't say is, you know what, uh, I'm here if anyone needs me. And, uh, you know, if lost people have a question, they can come to me. No, Paul says, I will go. And if I have to go in a suit, and I don't like suits, I'll put on a suit. If I have to go in shorts and a t-shirt, if I have to learn another language, if I have to learn another culture, if I have to learn to love this or that, I, it doesn't matter. I think if Paul was alive today, as much as it pains me to have to say this, I think he would be on TikTok and Snapchat because I think he would say, you know what? A majority of the population is on social media and I could reach them that way. And he might love it, he might hate it, but he would go for it. He would say, what do the people in this area do? What do they do recreationally? What do they do professionally? What do they do in the free time? What do they do on the weekends? I will go do it. I will meet them where they are and I will do whatever I can in any possible way 
so that some might be saved. What Paul does with his freedom is constrain himself to be the best servant he can for Christ. And the fact is, that's his testimony, right? When I, when I read through Galatians here, what Paul has said is, hey guys, listen, there's going to be some people that come to you, they're going to promote a false gospel. Well, what's, his, what's his refute for that? It's not a theological discourse. It's not, hey, I'm going to send you some stuff to read. I'm, I'm going to send you a DVD to watch. His reply is, well, here's what God did in my life. That's how he responds to this. And he has a twofold testimony. He has the testimony of how he was saved and what God's doing in his life right now. So I'm going to ask, what is your testimony? And again, you might have the Sunday school answer for that. But it's important to know, how were you saved? Can you tell someone? Paul says, you guys know, right? He's talking to a, a one degree of freedom here. He, these people know him already. You know who I was. You heard. You were scared of me. You guys know what I did. I don't know this for a fact, I'm using my imagination here, but I can, I can reason that Paul is writing to people that he's killed the relatives. That Paul could look at someone in the Galatian churches or the Judean churches and say, I killed your cousin. I was there when Luke was stoned, uh, sorry, when Stephen was stoned, right? Luke records Stephen's stoning in Acts. Paul says, I was there. Mm -hmm. I voted yes. I was coming for you. I bet he went to that church in Damascus at one point and said, I was coming for you guys. And that's what he's saying to them. You know who I am. I was coming to tear your walls down and string you guys up. And look at what Christ did. Right? He's not promoting himself. He's saying, look at me. Look what I was. I was the worst. And yet Christ saved me. So, He's not, you said, she said, this isn't what he's doing. They're, they're giving a false gospel. I'm giving a gospel. How can I prove mine's right? Look at this. Again, not self-promoting himself, but saying, you know what I was like. What would change that? What would make a person go from a murderer to this? And he, and he says, you, you're saying it yourselves. He who persecuted us is now preaching the gospel that each once tried to destroy. So how, how can you tell someone how you were saved. But also, what is God doing today? If you're like me and you were saved, you know, more than a year ago, that's a great testimony. Tell people how you were saved. But someone probably wants to know what's been going on in the last couple decades. Is that all God's done for you? And Paul adds that in as well, right? He talks about what's been going on. I, I interacted with Peter. He's not saying this account with Peter to make himself look good and put Peter down. That's not what he's doing. He's saying, no, I met Peter. I met the apostles. They approved of me. They, they said my gospel was, was right, that I wasn't preaching falsely. I wanted to check that just to be honest. I wanted to know I was in the right, right place. But I had to correct Peter, not because I'm smarter than him, but because God's been working in my life. God gave me the grace and the freedom to stand alongside my brother and help him. So he has a testimony of here's how I was saved, and here's a testimony of what God's been doing in my life recently. And so here's a, full, a couple of last things I'll, I'll close with. Just some, some encouragements, a challenge. Uh, I think it's good to know your, your full testimony to share that with someone. But this would take a lot of time. This would be the coworker that you're next to week after week after week after week. And you, you can divulge your life story. This would be a, a long lunch or a dinner or, or someone who just knows you and you can spill all of, the, all of the guts of it. I think that's important. I think that's useful. I, again, I don't know this, but I am confident that Paul told the story of his conversion more than a couple times. That if he had the chance, he sat down and he told someone, yep, here's who I was, here's what I did, here, here, I got blind, you know, fell on the ground, these other guys heard the voices, you, you, know, you know this guy, he was there, he heard the voice, you can ask him. I'm sure he went through that story dozens if not hundreds of times. I think it's also good to have a short one, a three-minute testimony. You're not always going to have years upon years to divulge every detail of your life with someone, right? Uh, if you're on a, a flight or if you're just standing by someone in the grocery store, or if, if you meet someone in a, in a short instance, you're not going to have the time just to spill all the beans. So can you talk about what God has done in your life, how you were saved, how did you hear the gospel, and you, can you do that in three minutes? And that can be kind of challenging. Uh, that can be a challenging topic. And I was encouraged by this uh, in a class that I took about two years ago at Southeastern, can you have a one-liner? 
can, can you drop a one line? Now, this isn't the full gospel. I don't think someone's going to get saved from this. But can you hit a one-liner? Because you might not have three minutes with someone. Right? If I'm standing in the line at Food Lion and, and I just happen to pick up a conversation, I'm not going to have that opportunity. Someone's not going to give me five minutes of their day just to stand and talk to a stranger. But can I drop a, a simple one-liner? And for me, it would sound like this. This is, this is mine. I was, at one time in life, I was angry and empty from the death of my father. Then Christ came into my life, and now I'm at peace and satisfied. That's not the full gospel, but that might get something stuck here. Ever had a song get stuck up here? Ever had someone, something, something someone said get stuck up here, and you just can't get it out? Maybe that'll get stuck up here, and someone will think about that. And maybe they'll see you again later, and they'll say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean you're at peace? Or maybe they'll say, you know, that happened to me too. And yours will sound different, but can you just drop a one-liner? And I would encourage you to have all three of these because a testimony is extraordinarily powerful. The story of what God has done will be extremely powerful. People can argue evolution. People can argue theology, and they love to. They can argue philosophy. People love to argue. I don't know if you knew that. Spoiler alert, people love to argue. And people can argue the why, but no one can argue that you have changed. For the people that knew me when I was in middle school, they knew a boy from elementary school, they knew a boy in middle school, they knew a boy in high school. A lot of things about them were the same. But there were some things that became, all of a sudden, radically different. And they could discount my reasoning, and I would tell them, you know, I, I, I came to know Jesus. And they could say, oh, I don't believe that nonsense. But they couldn't deny that I had changed. So you can look at Paul and say, eh, I don't know what happened to you. You had a stroke or something. But no one can deny that he was trying to murder people. And now he's not. Uh, just real quick, some other ways you can engage people with the gospel. Just talk. Talk to them. Talk about your church. So when you go to work tomorrow, rather than just say, I had a good weekend, mow the grass. Took me. You know, we had a great church service. This young, handsome, athletic Yankee talked. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> where's he at? I like to talk to him. Uh, ask others about their family beliefs, right? Especially in the South. Something I'm, I'm struck by in the South is, you know, so many people have such a deep root to a church. So, you know, does your family have any ties to, uh, to any churches in the area? Did your, your great-grandfather build that place? Do you still go there? Ask them about things. They'd love to talk about it. Limit to, yet, you know, don't do a lot of yes or no questions. You, you go to church? Yeah. No. Oh. You get them to talk. You know, how, how was your church service this weekend? Oh, why don't you go to church? What happened? And then talk to them about it. And just be kind to people. Invite people to church. Invite people to VBS. If you guys don't know, there's a little handout in your bulletin this morning, just a little short thing. You can hand to someone this week, inviting them and their family to the Vacation Bible School. They would love that. Invite them to all the events we have. I'm going to close with this. Uh, if you guys do not know these, these two, uh, this is the comedian-magician duo Penn and Teller. Uh, so they're uh, an entertainment act out of primarily Las Vegas. Uh, the taller guy on your left, is his name's Penn Gillette, uh, and he is a fairly well-known atheist. Uh, he is quite antagonistic to the gospel. So why is he in here? Probably the only time these guys have been in church. So why do I have him up? My roommate, and this is probably six or seven years ago, my roommate sent me a link to a YouTube video. And in the YouTube video... Uh, Mr. Gillette is sharing that he had just finished a show, and a man came up to him afterwards. You know, there was a big line of people wanting to meet him. And the man said, you know, uh, I, I've seen your show uh, several times, and I, you know, I love you guys. You guys are great. Your acts are great. Tonight was you know, even, even better than normal. And, you know, they just talked for a while and, you know, told him where he was from, and they just, you know, some small talk. And then the man said, you know, I want you to know that, that I'm a believer and, and what that means is I believe that, that God is real and that he judges our actions and we are all sinful and that one day when we die we'll be separated from him, that that won't be super pleasant. Uh, and, you know, I've really enjoyed you guys and, and that's caused me to care about you and I don't want that for you. And he hands him a Bible. And the Bible has all kinds of post-it notes and notations, places marked. He said, I wrote some things in the cover. I wrote some things, in, you know, where to start reading, maybe answer some common questions. Went over from him for a bit. And in the YouTube video... Pendulette says, you know, of course I don't believe that nonsense. That's ridiculous. He said, but. 
This man does. And he looks at the camera, and he says, for any of you that believe that, then you're not telling people like he did. What is wrong with you? He said, I don't, that's nonsense to me. Right? We're going on the ground and disappearing. But he thinks, I'm going to a terrible place. And he took the time to be vulnerable, to step out, to stand in line, to tell me because he wanted to warn me. So as of that video, and I, I don't follow the guy, so I'm not positive. My guess is he's still unsaved. But at the time of that video, he, he, hadn't, he hadn't changed his mind. But he's not as far gone as a Paul. But he understood the power of a testimony. He understood that, and I'm sure he's met Christians who were hypocritical, and I'm sure he met people who claimed the name of Christ or weren't. All those things that we can talk about and you'll hear people talk about and make excuses about. But he met someone whose heart was on fire for Christ and said, I'm burdened to talk to this man. He wasn't going to get speared. He didn't have to get on a boat. He knew his chances of success were almost the same as John Chow's. But he said, you know what, I'm going to step out and I'm going to talk about my life. I'm going to talk about the testimony of Scripture and in prayerful dependence on the Holy Spirit. I'm going to, I'm going to come to this guy and just bear it. Now, was he successful? I'm going to say, yeah. Because just like John Chow said, success is not measured on converts and church attendance and offerings. and It's on the obedience to Christ. I got in trouble from Lynn last time, so I have a good Spurgeon quote. Spurgeon said, he was a great British preacher, he said, Baptist preacher, I exhort you who fear the Lord and are appointed and are his appointed remembrancers to be in much prayer and in testimony. Pray and preach. Keep not silent. Tell out the simple gospel. The more you tell of pardon bought with blood, the better. Let's pray. Father God, you are good, you are great, you are worthy of the time we can give you this morning, you are worthy of our attention, and so much more. God, your gospel is good. The news that we are no longer separated from you, that we do not have to be separated from you, the news that your son would come and give his life as a ransom for many, that he would give us life that we can live to the full today, Lord, this is good news. And God, we pray that you would give us the courage and the power of your Holy Spirit as you've promised to take this good news and the story of how you've worked in our lives to our neighbors. That we would love our neighbors well in many ways, but chief among those ways would be telling them the good news of Christ, that he has come, that he has risen, and that through him we can have life everlasting. God, we pray that our families, that our coworkers, Lord, people that we can picture in our minds right now would hear the gospel They would hear it from our own lips. They would hear it from a myriad of sources. God, we pray for people like Pendulet. We pray for people like the Sentinelese, people that seem uh, just so determined to refuse you. God, we pray that you would break into them. Lord, the Apostle Paul was the last person that most would have considered savable, but yet you did a great work of mercy. So God, we pray that for those who have just violently rejected you. God, thank you for saving us when we have rejected you. We pray that this time, Lord, this morning would be pleasing to you. And as we sing and and pray, Lord, we pray that this offering would come up to you in a way that pleases you and glorifies your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
few announcements before we leave. Uh, there will be team tonight at 5 o'clock, followed by, uh, I'm sorry, youth tonight at 5 o'clock, followed by team kid at 5.30. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the table in the hall for the dinner. There's also a note in your bulletin by that. Uh, we'd ask that you'd sign up for that by next Sunday if you haven't already, but we would ask that you come and join for that. It would be a great time. Uh, again, information about that in your bulletin. We'll have our prayer meeting and time of testimony this Wednesday night at 7 here in the sanctuary, so we'd ask that you'd make time to come and join us for that. And then, as I already said, there's a handout in the bulletin uh, for the VBS. Check that out, and certainly uh, hand that to someone that you know that has youngins, that they could come and, and just experience that great time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you could ask Cindy about that today. Uh, and then there's other things in your bulletin for you to check out. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Have a great Sunday.